I want to introduce the first panel. The, and the first panel is all about the RIC, the RAN Intelligent Controller, otherwise also referred to as the operating system for the RAN. The RIC makes possible the ability to exploit the data that is there in the network and, uh, uh, and use it uh, for the beneficence of the operators themselves. Uh, we have a fantastic panel here. I'm going to briefly introduce them and then I'm going to talk, have them introduce themselves. Uh, Matty from AT&T is here, traveled all the way from New Jersey. Uh, Masood is here uh, from Capgemini. Um, Lance from VMware. Uh, Sami from Viavi uh, Solutions. Murli from Meta and Arthur from Juniper. So I think we have a fantastic panel. And I'll start this off with having each of them kind of say in their own words a little bit about themselves. I'll start with you, Matty. Yes, um, I've been at at t for 23 years now. My title is Lead Inventive Scientist. That just shows that I come from the kind of legacy of traditional research side of Bell Labs and then Channel Labs. My background is really in distributed systems and dependability in cloud computing. I, I only really got exposed to RAN with ORAN, like maybe six months or a year before ORAN became a thing. Our manager told us to start learning about RAN. And uh, the path went through the uh, basically near real-time rig software development. We had to co-create with one of the tier one RAN vendors to build a near real-time rig platform and, and that was open sourced and it's part of the ORAN software community. Um, I also acted as the PTL for the RIGCAP project and that kind of ties into the AIML because the first use case we wanted to implement was traffic steering and it was actually using two uh, ML models. Um, and uh, that use case was actually got gold, uh, silver badge at tip. I think it was the first use case that got the silver badge at tip. So I, I think that's good enough for introduction. Masood, my name is Masood Amin. I work for Capgemini and I've been working for the last 22 years. Uh, started as a um, Arisant and uh, then Arisant became Altran and Altran became Capgemini. That is the reality of uh, working in a you know information technology company. You stay there and your email IDs are getting changed. <laughs> so um, so Capgemini um, uh, is heavily invested and and one of the pioneers in in all that software defined networking disaggregation networking and now uh, RAN is just complex part of the network is getting opened up, uh, allows um, the startups to come up and look at what problem they want to solve. And that is the part that we really wanted to position. We are part of Uran Alliance. We are part of TIP. We are almost all these uh, uh, open forums, wherever possible, we are promoting it. Uh, we are promoting uh, Digital Catapult in UK. So there are so many areas where we are just trying to position that how this whole RAN system becomes more open. People will come, they can develop their applications, they can run their applications. That is where we are. Right. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Lance Uihara. I'm with VMware. Um, I lead the product management team for our RAN intelligence product portfolio, which includes our non real time work and our near real time work. I've been in VMware for about two and a half years, going on three years now, but um, this is the seller industry from um, the AMPS days. So I've um, seen a lot of changes over the years from just analog to the initial TDMAs and to CDMA type systems. But, you know, um, I truly believe the RIC is going to be the next big disruption in our industry. And, I, you know, I can just see it, the excitement. At VMware, we're not only developing the RIC platform, but we really are emphasizing the ecosystem. Because that's the way we feel our customers, the operators, will get control back, right? They can have management and control through these ecosystem of um, partners with their apps. And so that's one of the big things we've been focusing on is trying to develop not just our RIC platform, but the ecosystem and the industry in general. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion, you know, especially apply AIML as well. Um, we do have AIML running in production in one of our pre-production works as well. So thank you. Sami. Okay. So my name is uh, Sami Amani. I'm Chief Technology Officer of uh, the AVI Solutions. Um, and I've been um, part of um, the AVI for almost 10 years now. Before that, I was CEO of a company that was acquired by, at that time, the AVI was called GDSU. Somebody if we remember familiar with that. Before that, I was in uh, uh, CTO of Tektronic Communications. So 
you know, uh, my team is responsible for a lot of the open RAN activities, but to understand more about Viavi, Viavi has been just a measurement, uh, we are a test and measurement company that have been for a long time on the wireline and the wireless. I can see, for example, some of you are familiar with the TM500 product that we have. 75% of base testing out there, 5G, have been tested somehow, somewhere with one of the Viavi products, right? So we have been involved with that and, and with uh, Oran. In fact, we were part of the first test and measurement to be part of XRAN before it was called Oran, right? Because of the front hole and uh, a lot of the discussion there. So I, I believe there is a lot of, um, you know, expectation today in the industry about this new open innovation. Now, our role is to help everybody. We partner with everybody here is to help make it happen, to test it, to make sure that you have the same quality as what it is before RAN, but actually opening up the innovation platform. And I think we're going to discuss a lot about what data means here because, um, you know, as we said, AI is enabled today because of the availability of the data, right? So we, we are part of the machinery that should produce some of these data. So, you know, this is where we're seeing the big innovation is going to happen in this area. Good morning, everyone. I'm Murli Amaratan uh, from Meta. Um, I started my career in the satellite communications world, worked on Radium, which I still consider as one of the most exciting projects ever. Um, launched 60 satellites, inner, inner satellite links. Mm -hmm. I still can't forget those days where we successfully did that uh, at Morola, uh, by the way. Um, and then we moved from uh, satellites when Radium went backdrop uh, to CDMA, worked on CDMA for 10 plus years, supporting s systems in Japan, North America. We learned a lot about CDMA layer one and about uh, optimization, mostly performance optimization of CDMA networks. Then naturally moved to LTE. And then um, uh, self-organizing networks came along and I thought, well, with my performance optimization background, this seems to be a good way to close the loop and automate everything that I know about optimizing networks. So I jumped into SON. Around that time, Motorola decided to sell, off, sell us to Nokia, just like you said, you know, same company, same work, different email IDs. Um, so did SON for 10 years at Nokia. And then um, when TIP was, TIP announced RIA, uh, ran for instance automation, I thought, wow, okay, everything that I couldn't do at Nokia, uh, here is an independent body where I can accomplish a lot of the un un unmet, you know, unfulfilled dreams. Um, so I jumped over and they said, well, TIP doesn't hire people, you've got to go to Meta and ask them if they have a job that can then, you know, funnel you to TIP. And that's what I did. Um, so I lead the RIA technical, you know, the technical lead for the RIA subgroup within Open RAN at TIP. Uh, as you know, Meta has gone through a lot of changes. So every day my job description changes too. Um, but I'm lucky in that I can still spend 50% of my time as the tech lead at RIA. That's what brings me here into this audience that talks about Rick. But on the remaining 50% of my job, we still believe that in order to keep the quality of experience constant to our users, right? of meta apps, whether it's Wi-Fi or wireless, we want a consistent QoE, right, for all our users. So we have to intervene somehow uh, and bring in technologies that will improve operations of Wi-Fi and wireless networks. And in the wireless case, it's clearly the RIC that we see as an opportunity uh, with a new Y1 interface that's being defined in the RIC. It, so it makes it all the more important for us to focus in that space and see if there are analytics that we can bring directly into our apps, into our data centers, uh, and, and then become good citizens of wireless networks, right? Net service aware networks, network aware services, and so on. That's what I'm focused on. The remaining 50% of my time outside of the work we did in, do in TIP. Uh, in TIP, we work very closely with IRA. Uh, and as Maddie mentioned, probably we have 11 operators who are driving the RIA program. Uh, we have, what, 15 to 20 vendors who are interested in building apps, and we uh, badged and uh, trialed probably about seven or eight apps so far, all ML, you know, driven applications. So, yep, that's me. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Arda. Hello. I'm Arda. Maybe the best for last. Thank you. I'm Arda Ackman. Uh, I'm with Juniper Networks. I'm a Senior Director of Engineering, leading RIC Product Management, uh, and I'm also very active in Oran. I started with, um, if some of you may remember, Bell Northern Research, which became Northern Networks, Nortel. Uh, so for the last 25 years or so, I've been in wireless uh, industry, worked at almost every layer from physical layer up. Uh, and um, I think six, seven years ago, 
in my previous company, we started building a controller. Uh, at the time, there was no XRAN, no ORM yet. And then we heard about XRAN, um, similar concept, uh, cool idea, we joined. Been member of XRAN, which became ORN since then. I'm chairing uh, ORN, been very active in ORN is Juniper. Uh, I'm chairing use case task group, slicing task group, and uh, leading Juniper delegate, uh, delegation for number of working group. Similar to Lance, uh, uh, building day in, day out, uh, Rick, uh, uh, and use cases. And uh, you see Juniper and VMware. I think um, with Rick, there is a big shift in the industry. Newcomers, uh, smaller companies, startups, building use cases. Juniper, a traditional wireline company, building wireless products, VMware, uh, similarly, rather than the usual uh, Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei uh, type companies. So we are open up, opening up the networks so there can be innovation. Um, and we're also active with AML. Um, Ajit uh, from uh, Juniper will be in the third panel. Um, jointly, we delivered the um, actual use case to a European tier one operator, uh, used their data, um, built a use case, executed, learned quite a bit, uh, both operator and us. And I'm very excited to be a part of this panel today. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Uh, we've used the term Rick a lot here. Many in the audience may actually be familiar with the term, but might benefit from a definition. So I think, Maddie, you and Arda have probably spent the most time in thinking about this in terms of literally calendar time. So I'm going to lead off with you, Maddie, and then I'll come to you, Arda. What is the RIC? Can you define it for us? Well, just uh, explain it. One, one sentence uh, description would be, RIC is what makes RAN software defined. You, all those words you already mentioned before. But um, what is important about RIC, and there's actually two RICs, like some people already mentioned, there's the near real-time RIC and non-real-time RIC. But regardless, these RICs are based on standardized interfaces. So there's an interface standardized between the RIC and the underlying RAN. And then there's a standardized interface at the RIC uh, for the X apps and R apps that, that are the applications that run on these platforms. So this is really, this is what makes it important that these interfaces are standardized. So anybody can start building X apps and R apps. And then hopefully when everything stabilizes and all the E2 is available, we have this huge ecosystem where um, different companies can basically get a foothold in the RAND rather than it just being the few that we have right now. And just the pace of innovation hopefully increases astronomically and ability to customize your network and all these good things. Arla, you want to help expand and yes, I have uh, also explain what an XAP is and an RAP. Um, that's a new term as well to many. Thank you. So you used one of my terms. Um, if, if Juniper, uh, you may have heard this, um, Constantin. Uh, I've been using that term and uh, I, I guess it's becoming an industry term. We think RIC is the operating system of RAN. Um, if you think about Sun, uh, if you remember those days, Compact, everybody had their own workstation and everybody had their own operating system and nobody um, could port applications, XAMPs or RIPs between these different systems. So you have to understand the hardware, uh, know a lot about underlying technology to establish build applications. RIC is changing that. With Rick, um, just like what happened in PC with Windows or Linux, you don't need to think about what the base station does, what hardware it runs on, which layers it's running on, uh, the specs would change. But the data is now being exposed to X apps and R apps. So we can use that data that is being exposed, build models. And then with the standard interfaces, as Mati said, E2 and A1, applications can control the brand behavior. So all of a sudden, underlying base station behavior being exposed, whether it's Nokia, Ericsson, uh, Mavinir, any other company, now the application developers like Ira have access to this data, and uh, we are, as an industry, able to build models, deploy models, and upgrade them in real time through these X apps and R apps. Cool. Anybody want to add anything to this? 
Um, well, I, I think just from a Rick in general, you know, as Arda was saying, it's the operating system of the RAN, but you can also look at it as an abstraction layer, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where companies like Juniper as well as VMware have long history of abstracting underlying platforms. And so the RIC, the RAN Intelligent Controller, really abstracts the underlying RAN. And as he was saying, these applications now can run on top of this RAN, no matter what RAN is underneath that, through these open interfaces. And that's what really now opens up um, opportunities for broad uh, selection of companies to introduce applications to solve problems because we're abstracting the RAN, providing this interface for all of these developers, now this ecosystem of developers. And that's what's really exciting about this, is it opens up this entire ecosystem to you know just people with great ideas, innovators that didn't have a route to market before. And that's one of the key things that you'll see in the rec. Thank you. I think you started to get into my next question, but I'm gonna ask that anyway. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, uh, so I was gonna ask, what is the vision behind the rec? Right, and I think you guys have all each, in your own way, touched upon it a little bit. And I'm going to bring you all in and again. But Murli, I'm going to vector this one to you. I know you have a fairly strong opinion on this topic. Yeah, um, I think you have to go down memory lane back to one G. You really appreciate why the RIC is important and why it's visionary. Uh, if you look at how the tech cellular technologies have evolved since we started on this 30 years ago or so, um, three things remain constant. One complexity. We kept adding complexity to every technology, every G, and now we're sitting at 5G where 2G is still there, right? 2G hasn't disappeared. You still have to support handovers between 2G and 5G and 3G and LTE, everything in the middle. So that's complexity. We've added you know, more carriers, heterogeneous networks. So complexity is one thing. Two is you have to tune. Uh, wireless networks are in very different deployments, right? and urban to rural, there's the same piece of software that runs everywhere, but there's tons of tuning knobs that you got to tune in order to get that network working correctly, catering to a certain type of traffic in a given area, right? Type of types of users, type of traffic, all that change. That's number two. Three, everything was done on human time, right? The people who did the tuning were not machine-led, human-led. People knew in their, in their heads how to go tweak a particular knob, how to measure it, how to interpret a particular KPI. And it was all done on human time. And this continued in every G, right? We didn't automate optimization. SON kind of came around, but you know there were some things that SON didn't do very well, right? So I think the RIC solves all these three problems. It brings the data to apps in a way that uh, some, you know, as was mentioned, it can build these X apps and R apps and uh, and then this can be built by third parties, right? People who have no knowledge of the RAN with the right abstraction layers, with the right hiding of complexity. You know, there's a lot of complexity there and uh, by hiding that complexity and exposing information in a way that you can train ML models and you can build apps uh, just knowing how to work with these APIs, that's one of the values that Rake brings in. And they, moving from human time to machine time, the non-real time Rake, Right, that still operates on human time. Certain decisions have to be made at that cadence. You can't change that uh, because you got to get in data from different sources. You got to look at you know various aspects of the network, various aspects of traffic models, and so on uh, before you make a decision and close the loop. So that aspect of uh, working in that cadence, non-real time, is important. But then you have to close the loop in near real time as well because you know. Uh, the RAN and the applications that drive the RAN uh, have to know how to be good citizens of the RAN in real time or near real time. So near real time break provides that ability as well. The apps that run on the near real time break, you know, solves that problem as well. Um, so I think the RIC, you know, solves a lot of the problems that were a deterrence to automation and closing the loop in, in all of our Gs, right? That we've uh, tried to accomplish this for years and years and years, but I think the RIC is magical from that standpoint. You know, it just brings in the right interfaces, exposes the right amount of data, uh, and more importantly, allows third parties to build apps, you know, which was not possible before. Um, so so I, that's what we're encouraging through TIP and through the work we do at Meta. Um, you know, bring third parties to the platform. They have the knowledge of the apps, right, which the wireless engineers and the RAN engineers don't have. The RAN engineers know how to operate the RAN. 
But in order for that RAN to work and provide a good network, a good service to apps, it you need that you know the meeting of the minds where the app developers and you know as the and these apps are going to get more and more complex. Uh, the traffic model is only it's only starting, I think, to reach another level of complexity. We were just talking about you know AR coming in, V2X coming in, you know unmentioned what machine to machine. The traffic model that we knew that started with voice and SMS, you know, now it's short video and short form video. And I'll tell you from Meta, short form video is a whole new new ball game compared to all the video traffic that we were generating, you know, from Meta and Google and uh, all these other companies. Uh, short form video is going to take it to a whole new, another level that already has, you know, with Reels and TikTok and other products and YouTube as well. Um, AR, we are going to take it to a whole new dimension. So human time of closing the loop isn't going to cut it anymore, right? So we need a machine and machine intelligence right, to be, in, uh, to, to, to be uh, you know, more direct to close this loop. And uh, that's what Rick enables, in my view. Thank you. Masood, I'm going to bring you into this conversation. Yeah. You guys deal with a lot of operators. You've seen a lot of challenges with operators. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on how do you see what the vision of the Rick and from your perspective? So... Um, <clears throat> As, as Murli said that, right, the networks are becoming complex. Uh, they need to be protected. They need to be secure. And uh, as we introduce more complexity, uh, the the foundation is how to bring productivity into this network, which is complex, is open up. Let these startups come into a play and focus on one specific problem rather than, you know, working on multiple problems. So... The startups could focus just on observability part, that how you can make a network more observable. Uh, second could be just focusing on security part. Third could be focusing on SON part. So the whole idea is that uh, RIC is becoming, uh, and RIC should become foundation of innovation. That is what we see that. That is where uh, even our discussions and, and, and all the you know operators, they are also want participation of um, of uh, startups and and bring that bigger ideas in a nimble way in a cost effective way that is the foundation of the innovation and that is where we wanted that uh, Rick should move and that is where I believe that uh, whatever you call it near real time non real time the whole idea is that opening up those APIs and and making the application thank you Lance you want to add something to that um yeah you know, just to add to what Murley was saying about you know um, optimization and uh, potential that has you know for many of you who are familiar with that um, sun world um we often now view the rick as generations beyond that the mm -hmm. the access that the rick provide the data access that the rick provides um was never available to the sun you know uh, sun platforms before um the ability to get data from external networks right so sun really dealt with the ran but with the ran intelligent controllers you can now ingest data you can control things even outside of the RAN. there's interfaces there and so the possibilities grow even more uh, with the near real-time rig there's now access to much finer time grain information and control loops that son didn't have again before so as Murillo was saying it just opens up a huge potential now for again these app developers who never had access to the data access to the control interfaces that's what it provides and, and that's why it's so exciting Sammy, you look like you have. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to actually give you a, a different perspective. I mean, we have, because of where we are in the industry life cycle, we tend to actually have access to technology and do technology beforehand. I mean, we started 5G in 2013. That's our mm -hmm. first product we sold in 5G that it was not even discussion about 5G. Because when things work, you need to test it. When it doesn't work, you still need to test it, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you know... Um, so it's amazing because uh, I think uh, we're talking about we were in 6G. Uh, we're already working in 6G today. We're working, looking at the ne next uh, level. So you're saying about the vision of Derek. I mean, 6G is actually looking at Derek as already an established thing, right? Because if you think about where is where we're going, and, and I argue that we shouldn't be calling 6G and 7G. I mean, I always think that after 5G, there should be no G. But I mean, that's a different yeah, that's, that's <laughs> together. I'm with you on that. Right. But I mean, but it, it is actually going to be software release, right? So where we are going next with AI embedded in the network, this is really what we really need. I don't see what other places other than Rick can actually do that. So it's, there is a lot of already potential play, you know, place for Rick 
in the next generation where it's going to happen. And you mentioned a lot of the data access, but you know, I would always say that you know the best application is the one we don't know yet, right? Because when you start exposing a lot of more data, you get a lot of this innovation of the ideas. And, and this is where Derek, I think, is going to play a big role, is opening up this data ecosystem, right? So that people can innovate. So, you know, you say I have a vision of, of, of Rick. I think, Rick, you know, it's going to be time it takes to mature, but I mean, we are there and, and it's going to be important for the future. Got it. Arda, you want to comment on this before yeah. I move on? Yes. Um, I think uh, there were uh, already very good comments. I'll sh uh, shift it slightly. Uh, just before the meeting, we were having a chat about the future of operators, uh, like at and or Verizon. Are they going to become a pg and &E? If there is no change in the industry, or are we going to add intelligence so operators can continue to innovate? And I think Rick is the driver for that innovation. Through insertion of Rick, now operators don't have to shift towards becoming just pipes. No different than a pg &E. You turn on your electricity, you have power on. You always have your internet on. But if you if they can expose the data, if they let third parties, operators themselves, companies like Juniper, VMware, change the behavior of the network, then we are opening up innovation and have room for operators to grow and innovate. Got it. Okay. So you guys have touched upon several aspects of RIC standardiz the standardization of interfaces facilitates the, uh, the possibility of a RIC. RIC in turn makes a lot of the data in the network available, right? The question I want to pose to you guys is, is Rick enabling AI-defined networking? A lot of you guys said AI needs to be embedded in the network, right? So I'm introducing a new term here, right? Would love to have you guys react to that. Is this what is where we're headed? What does it mean to you if it is? Um, so I'll throw it open. And in this case, let's see. Lance, I'll start with you. Okay, sure. Right. Um, it's a great term, AI-defined networking. You know. Um, if you look at how the RAN has evolved over the years, we started out, you know, as we often talked about the, the more legacy systems where things were uh, very vertically integrated, you had solutions coming from a single vendor and our customers were tied to that. Um, there was an introduction of, of virtual RAN, right? Where, okay, so we disaggregated the hardware and software, but there wasn't really any real innovation there because same functionality, yeah, it might be packaged differently. It came from the same people, same vertical solution. Um, you know, when we started talking about the RAN Intelligent Controller, it now allows the disaggregation of the software itself, the control and management from the user data plane, right? And that's incredible. I mean, now you have software-defined RAN. And the next evolution of that will be this AI-defined RAN, where now you can bring in more of this intent-based type of intelligence, right? You're not only just having this management and control separation, but you can introduce machine learning, automation, and just that whole new realm of possibilities. And that's why I think this term fits very well. You know, that next generation will be an AI-defined network, or more importantly, an AI-defined network. Okay. Who wants to go next? Anybody else? So, um, I like, so if you look at the um, uh, RAN, um, so lots of heterogeneous network is there, right? You have a small cell, you have a, a sub six millimeter wave, and you have macro networks coverage and all that. Um, and if you look at it, how are you going to provide a seamless connectivity to the users? Even a spectrum, how you're going to use that spectrum wisely so that you can deliver the speech that you know customers are looking for. And uh, that is where if you try to define everything with a very specific uh, structured program and, and you deliver a release and that release is going to work, let's say, for next six months, maybe a year because RAN releases are, nobody is going to upgrade them. And if you have a very structured way of uh, managing a net network, um, basically you are not going to deliver or solve those complexities. No. Well, piling up those problems phase by phase. But if you introduce, and 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 the and the that is the reason this RIC has an intelligence component in between, that it's a RAN intelligent controller. The whole idea is that it should learn itself, adjust itself, heal itself, and deliver the promises of the network and and the uh, and the usage of the spectrums and security and all that. So we are not dependent upon 
uh, another release which is coming in a year. We are solving as time of day changes, as the profile changes, as the user changes. That is what it is. So it is truly now, now we have AI. It has got a bigger name when, when chat GTP has come up, but deep learning, neural nets, they are all there and they are they are helping these applications to become self-learning, self-prepared. You're describing an autonomous rare. Yeah. yeah right. In a way. That, so, so basically, that is the whole idea that AI is going to enable all that and, 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 and operators also, for example, they're talking about autonomous networking. I mean, you have an autonomous driving. There are different levels. Um, TM Forum has come up and say that here are five levels of uh, autonomous networking. And uh, there are operators who are saying that they have to go uh, level four at least uh, by 2025, which is basically putting a very specific objective that human intervention should be very, very minimal. If you have to go to that level of uh, independence and uh, and manageability, you require AI defined RAN for sure, because RAN is a complex, RAN is a uh, ubiquitous. Arda? Yes, um, that's a very good term what you're introducing, and I want to talk about two specific examples. Uh, sure. One of them is the work we did for a European tier one. Uh, the use case is sliced SLA assurance, where um, operators uh, through 5G now able to, they're able to provide services for uh, different services through slices, and each slice have an SLA associated with. So when you start having many different slices, many different services, but your resources are limited. Mm -hmm. There is a big challenge of how do you optimize net network so you can meet all of the SLE requirements on a limited frequency range. We can have rule-based use cases uh, that works great, but then through AIML, uh, we are able to learn mm -hmm. the patterns, shift resource utilization, and optimize these at the same time. And our results have been very good with this European operator. And now we are working towards the energy savings use cases. And the second one is your demo. Um, the demo with your large language model, ChatGPT or GPT is an excellent one where uh, we can have uh, an interface for an operator to define their intents. Silly. Those intents becoming our apps running on DIC or XAMPs running on VIC, controlling the network, and then getting back to you with results. Got it. Okay. Murli or Sami, do you guys want to have a comment? Or um, uh, I'm, I'm going to come to you. Yeah. I'll, 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 you know, um, I'll go back to the human nature, you know, way in which networks were optimized. And and uh, if you look at how we did this, it was mostly trial and error. And if I look at how, you know, we achieved a certain answer you know, if we change this configuration parameter, did this change KPI A, B, C, or D? Uh, most of the answers came through trial and error. And if you look at the ML technology, whether it's backprop or reinforcement learning, it's trial and error, right? ML is also learning through trial and error. So I think from that standpoint, it almost looks like, you know, this is the natural way in which you transfer human knowledge to machine learning because the way in which it happens is pretty much the same. Um, and then also, you know, in ML, we always say AI ML, you know, where there is data, there's ML, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and Rick is the, going to become this golden source of data. And uh, we, we clearly, you know, sometimes data is sensitive, uh, privacy sensitive, and we don't get a lot of data from operators. So we have to invest in digital twins, which uh, emulate, you know, actual conditions. And if we're looking at performance optimization, unless you have a network that represents a real, you know, network, a simulator that represents a real network, you will not, uh, you will not, you know, really optimize anything because uh, a simulation world isn't always matching or representative of, of, of a real world. So uh, investing in digital twins is important. ML is a big, you know, part of that as well. Uh, you have to use machine learning. You know, Meta had a project where we built a digital twin and to predict RSRP, we didn't need, you know, neural networks that were very complex. We just used Bayesian optimization and that was good enough to you know, uh, predict RSRP, RSR, QSI, and various other network, you know, network measurements. So I think uh, we've, you know, it's clearly proven that ML will play a big role, not only in the XAPs and our apps. Um, I, would, I would also say that more than ML needing data, RAN needs ML because a lot of the KPIs we have today aren't classified or aren't labeled, right? Um, there's a lot of measurements that we make. We don't. We haven't put proper labels on it. So using um, 
you know, unsupervised learning methods to just classify the data. I think that's the first big step we have to take. Uh, once it's classified, then supervised learning comes in uh, to then, you know, predict, uh, you know, the next action that's, that we need to take in a wireless network or the next KPI change that's going to happen so that you can proactively make configuration changes and, Good. and, and be adaptive, you know, uh, with the RAN. Uh, to ensure performance. So I think ML plays a lot of different roles, you know, uh, uh, in, in wireless. Thank you. Matty, I know you had a comment that you wanted to make. Uh, uh, yeah, define yes. Um, mm -hmm. So when we started this, actually two, two comments, when we started this uh, near real-time rig platform work with Nokia, ML was definitely one of the driving use cases because, um, well, there's not necessarily enough resources at the G node bees or E node bees to run ML. Uh, vendors are very interested in ML. So it was obvious the near real time rig was kind of obvious place. You can put as many compute resources as your use cases need. You can collect data for a duration of time that you need to train your machine learning models. And and so it was it was definitely in the picture to start with. But then the other comment I want to make uh, and it kind of resonates with some of the commentary here. We've done some uh, trials with uh, traffic steering, basically the goal to optimize throughput or spectral efficiency. And what we have found out that that you can, uh, well, basically we would start by writing a deterministic algorithm with if and else statements and, and trying to kind of change the parameters that Morley was talking about to get the traffic moving where we want it to go. But what we found is that by collecting the data from this uh, what we call heuristic algorithm and training a machine learning model with that actually does much better, like significantly better than the, and, and the fact is like many speakers here mentioned, the RAN is very complex and every, every cell or neighbor relation is kind of unique and, and the, how the users move at what time of the day, what do they do is unique. So it's impossible to write deterministic algorithm that factors in all these things. ML is really good for that. Fantastic. Super rich. We can probably keep going. I have more questions in my mind. I could keep asking. But we're sort of at the halfway mark. Time check for you guys as well. Right. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, there are obviously challenges to any time a new technology emerges. How do you deploy it? Right. So let's shift gears to talk about that a little bit. Right. What do you guys see as some of the challenges in deploying a RIC based architecture? It's a fairly fundamental shift in the architecture of the RAN itself, right? So what are the challenges that you see? Um, who do I start with? I'm going to start with you, Masood, because mm -hmm. you're kind of interacting with operators. You're in the yeah. middle of putting these things out. Right. So um, so when you when you try to dismantle a structure, and, and RAN is a very fairly complex, and that is the reason I think Software-defined networking started with the switches and data centers and then finally coming to the core of complexity of the network. Um, and uh, and even we have the definitions, uh, getting the RUs connected to the CUNDU and CUNDU have got their own Mac, sometimes, uh, you know, exposing some of those functionality. We, we believe that network can become more vulnerable for changes and, and may create problems. Um, so there are some complexity in terms of uh, what you can expose as a data as a telemetry information from the CU and DU itself. That is one. Uh, second thing is that the RIC and then there is a, you know, RIC, real-time and non-real-time. Actually, this is coming up because of the complexity and the latencies are required in certain operations. If you are dealing with Mac, maybe it's a real-time. It has to be very near. Yeah. If you are uh, guessing uh, subscriber movement, which is slow, could be a non-real-time rig. So, um, so we are also learning uh, as we go through deployments that there are certain functions that, that requires real-time operations and they should be here. And there are certain things that we can, though we believe initially that non-real-time rig may not be that effective, but what we see that it provides a much better um, uh, uh, control and without impacting the stability of the CU and DU that you can get the data, process that data and get the KPIs about the network usage, subscriber management and all that which is coming in the non-real time rate. So, um, but in these, I mean, this is the, uh, this is 
as we are trying to, it's like an onion, we are peeling it out and we see challenges. The more you try to disagree in the functions, some of those things have not designed. Math, for example, is not designed that you can just, just split it up in two functionalities. So uh, those are the challenges that we typically see. One is the architectural changes. Another is, of course, uh, API, what APIs that, 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 uh, that are required. So every day we see that there are certain changes and, and Capgemini has both CU and DU, non-real-time break and real-time break. So we see that, you know, including it is not about that what you can expose. Sometimes you expose certain functionality and you see the challenges. So one of the projects that we did was a project Marconi. Uh, where especially we wanted to see how and what are the things that you can bring out out of the Mac layer. And we saw that if, you, if you're if really trying to position certain things from the Mac layer, systems become sometimes unstable. Mm -hmm. So we need to see that and maybe uh, as we go in the next generation, we have to redesign the Mac operations also in certain fashion where it becomes much more compact. And, and certain functionalities, we have to go uh, back to the specification where it should be released and, and relaxed. Got it? Yeah. Sami, I know you have some thoughts on this matter. Too. Yeah. So definitely deployment problems where we see is that th there was a lot of discussion about, you know, op you know Open RAN is, is a new idea and coming in. Remember, you know, where a lot of, you know, big vendors have been building the RAN for 30, 40 years, right? They, they come combine a lot of expertise internally to build these trends. So now you're opening it up, right? One of the challenges that we see is that a lot of the testing that goes into, you know, a lot of the labs, they they reflect a certain scenario, but once you start going deploying, this is where you're going to start seeing different kind of traffic, different kind of behavior, different kind of environment, right? And again, taking 30 years of expertise and now I'm trying to compress it and try to do something quick. And I think this is where AI actually and, and working in an ecosystem, bringing real data from the field and trying to build this digital twin that can actually help people anticipate all of these different, you know, um, use cases, corner cases, right? All of these different scenarios and actually have it before deployment. Because I think the problem is, you know, with Operand in general, and let's be fair, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's where we need to go, but there is still a lot of question about maturity, is it still ready for deployment or not? I mean, we are seeing some examples that's already in, in some areas, but I, I believe that this uh, this idea of bringing data from the field, right, and building this digital twin that can help anticipate how deployment is going to look like, how you're going to scale it up, how you're going to have different scenarios, you know, V2X, you know, machine to machine. These are all things that you can simulate re using real data and bring it to, you know, um, development time so that you have more of the confidence when you're doing the deployment, you are seeing these latency issues. There are so many different scenarios we can do, you know, how you're gonna inject some of these latency uh, calculation when you're developing the app so that the app can adapt to that, right? So this is an area I think it's also very important to consider. Got it. Lance and Arda, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna have you guys wrap up this section, right? Because you guys as vendors potentially might have yes. solutions to some of these projections. Yeah. But Maddie, I want to bring you in because you're the, you're the only operator on this panel. So it would be good to get an operator perspective on. Uh... Yeah, I could probably give a half an hour talk about the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just to kind of highlight some of the maybe things that haven't been brought up. One one thing is that the RIC is the, not the only thing happening in, in RAN. There's RAN virtualization, there's open front hall. So we're getting into this world where we get radios from one vendor, hardware from another one, CAS layer, DU, CU, RIC, X apps, uh, R apps, and RIC platform. So, so we're getting into this very complex world that is very different than what we are used to. So that's, that's a big challenge, but it's also an opportunity because now innovation can happen in each one of these layers independently. But uh, so it's kind of maybe hard to blame us for not moving so quickly because there's a lot of other things happening as well. But uh, going specifically to the near real time rig that I've been working on, I think the biggest challenge from my point of view is E2 availability. Um, there are some, some RAND vendors that are further along, but, uh, but um, that's kind of the 
we need E2 to really do X apps. Uh, RIG platforms, there's a lot of vendors out there. There's X app vendors very, very anxious to deploy their X apps, but unless we have E2, uh, we can't really do much. And um, specifically to X apps, uh, if you have talked to me like within the last three years, I've probably talked about conflict between X apps and, and maybe Arda has some solutions today. But the, the fact that when we start getting X apps from different vendors, uh, when we put them together, how do we argue that that combination actually uh, does what it's supposed to and not have some emergent undesirable behavior? And actually uh, in working group three in Oran, uh, in the last face-to-face -face meeting a couple of weeks ago, there was a work item proposed for that. And, and it seemed like there was very enthusiastic reception to that work item. So those were just a couple of things. Those are good. Okay. Those are actually really good. Maybe so, I can continue. Yeah, I'll I was going to come to you. Right? Yeah, yeah. it. So Mehdi already covered uh, the two uh, big blockers. Uh, the network is complex. And when you introduce many players, it's not easy for operators because they are used to going to Ericsson and uh, turnkey uh, gets features at Ericsson, Nokia cost. They are great companies, but comes at a cost and the timeline. Now, this network is complex uh, with open and many vendors. I think uh, there are uh, players like IBM, Capgemini, and others as SIs who bring this uh, ecosystem together. And companies like Juniper VM were establishing the RIC and application players by pre certifying. Uh, they are working with TIP on a certification uh, pr um, project right now. Once we can show that some use cases are certified, then operators will have more peace of mind knowing these stack are working together. The second is the e availability. Uh, I think RAM vendors are working on it. Not there, but some of them are advancing. With more and more e will enable access, but on a one side and RFs, uh, there's already a lot of possibility. The, uh, one of the bigger points, as I said, is conflict management. Um, in, in order and it's being worked on uh, is Juniper Rick, we already support that feature. And uh, we are working with VAV on a European tier one to demonstrate um, the conflict of energy savings and SLA assurance. We have an SLA to meet mm -hmm. and that requires allocation of resources, but if energy savings feature detects low periods of activity, wants to shut down the base station, how would SLA be impacted? Mm -hmm. So how do you handle? These are very diff different um, conflicts than just optimizing your handover. So we are building solutions as part of the platform and we'll be jointly demonstrating with VAV to a European tier one that will help enable um, the conflict across uh, main conflict user resolution. Okay, got it. Okay. Aren't you have some thoughts to add? Um, yeah, no, you know, many of the, I guess, topics highlight one of the challenges is is this complexity and the different vendors that you have to integrate with to make this work. And you know that's that's one of the things about this ecosystem, even the folks here we're working with. Um, yeah. For example, with Viabi, you know, there's testing issues, right? So we are actually working them, with them closely in terms of trying to bring a test platform that's much easier for app partners to consume and use. Because as you develop all these apps, you need some way to test them. You know, Viabi has a great tester that we can partner with and then bring that to our ecosystem. And then, you know, working even with, with TIP in terms of badging these things and just broadening that ecosystem and bringing the plug fest together, right? So I think it is going to take a lot of effort among the industry, all of us, to help our customers feel more comfortable that they have a solution, you know, that will work together, that integrates well, that interoperates well. I think that's going to be one of the key things, just making them feel comfortable. You know, one thing is we're asking a lot of this industry. We're coming from an industry that um, was built on, again, the, a lot of these vertical solutions, um, appliances, and we're trying to take it into the cloud world. And many of our customers and these operators don't have that expertise yet. You know, Maddie is one of the rare ones who has this extremely um, deep knowledge in cloud networks, but that's not common across the operators. So that's why you see companies like Juniper and VMware in here now. We have a we're cloud companies. That's what we do. We abstract things. We put them into the cloud. And so we can bring together the RAN, our RAN knowledge together with this cloud and help the industry feel comfortable and move them along. Because that's going to be really critical in this transformation, right? As Matt is saying, there's a lot going on. And anything we can do as an ecosystem and even, you know, um, 
So the competitors working together, we're going to need to do that to help bring this to fruition. So we've talked a lot about uh, the opportunity that the RIC presents, right? The opportunity the RIC unlocks in AI ML. Talked quite a bit about the challenges, right? Where is the state of the industry in terms of adoption of the RIC? We haven't talked about that, right? I mean, is there generally excitement about adopting the RIC or is it sort of a wait and see? If you guys could comment on that, that would all think I'll also be useful for folks here. It's not a question I had rehearsed with. Yes, uh, I, I can. I apologize ahead of time for that. Yeah. If okay, I can start, uh, and then Lance uh, maybe can continue because we are um, competitors, but we are. Uh, I think the uh, truly independent vendor, big vendors. Uh, I know of uh, Ericsson. Uh, if you are familiar with the strategy, Ericsson is opening up only non-real time. Nokia is working on both. Mavi near Samsung, they will have their own RICs, but still closed system. Okay. VMware and Juniper are independents, and uh, that's a big advantage for operators because now they can have one RIC controlling uh, Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung, Mavi near. They don't have to worry about this conflict of interest between them. Uh, we have a very mature product, uh, it's generally available, and we've been uh, trialing it in uh, Europe more than I would say in uh, North America. I think Europe and Japan. Is slightly ahead of uh, North America. We had field trials in Vodafone where we had demonstrated uh, about three months long trial with uh, improvement on edge user throughput, significant improvement. These are mm -hmm. Vodafone numbers, not uh, Juniper claims. And it was a partner application. So we had the platform, a third party application, uh, along with the Juniper application. And in Almost all of the European tier ones, there is strong interest, and some of them have plans to deploy RIC uh, next year. And I think um, in North America, uh, as Matty said, uh, uh, there will be more and more interest, but as the whole industry, we need to show things are working together, and we need to have killer applications from companies like Ira, so operators have a reason to start deploying. Got it. Okay. You want to add to that? Oh, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think in as far as both the Juniper and the VMware work platforms, um, we're out there trialing now with major tier ones. So that's happening. Um, it is happening more with, you know, the European vend, uh, operators, but we also are conducting trials um, with some of the major North American operators as well. But I, I agree. I think, you know, it's, again, making, making our customers feel comfortable and confident that it's ready to be deployed, um, you know, from what we see, it'll probably be more of a non-real-time work that'll first come out, you know, into production first. We can see that as, you know, Ardo saying they're planning to deploy starting next year. Yeah. The near real-time work will probably lag a little is because Mario is saying we need the E2 interface and a lot of production grade is not out there yet, but, but it'll happen. And, you know, again, having these applications like, you know, companies from IRA that have these compelling use cases that the industry needs, that's what's going to also help drive it. But but it is it's ready. I mean, we're trialing already, and I can I can see the path to production into these networks. So I'm hearing you guys say non real time rig 2024, kind of in deployment, near real time rig 25. Yeah, maybe, right? But yeah, depends yeah. on that interface. Yeah, yeah that's that means. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment on yeah. this one? So uh, what we see that um, uh, almost every operator. Mm. Um, labs, this is a digital catapult, but it's a tip, um, I4TY, uh, you would find that RIC is there into those labs. Um, nobody's denying it. Uh, nobody yeah. is saying that the system is not and we don't want that. People have expectation. Stability, people have expectation on APIs and models and all that. So which is a good thing. So there is no going back. So we might be delayed because of some models and, and trials and decision cycle, what they want to go and how they want to go. But there is no going back. That is the part that, that we have seen. And we have seen all across APAC, India, uh, Europe, uh, here, MSOs, uh, which is, you know, yep. cousin of yep. Telco, they are, they, they, are, they are also going that way. Okay. That's a very strong statement, actually, that, that you're seeing momentum move yep. in the direction of the RIC and not not seeing anybody go backwards on it. No, no, no nobody's talking about that, you know, we, we don't want to go there. Okay. People want to see that the system becomes more stable, scalable, challenges as you Okay, that's a very long stay. Okay. All right, so we sort of have 10 minutes left. I have three more questions. <laughs> so we won't get, I know we won't get all of them. Um, 
So I'm debating between what does the industry lose without a RIC, right? Versus how does the RIC evolve, right? And I'm leaning towards how does the RIC evolve, right? Because I think we've talked a lot about uh, what might the, what the industry gains and the absence of that they can audience can conclude, right? So let's go to how do we anticipate the RIC evolving over time, right? And Murli, I'll start with you, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're seeing a lot of interest, uh, as we've just said, you know, we're not going backwards, we're going forward. Uh, what hasn't been mentioned so far is the third-party ecosystem that are building these apps. We're seeing a lot of interest from small companies like Ira, uh, creating some, you know, extremely complex solutions for run optimization. Uh, I would say differentiated solutions. And what we'd like to see from a tip perspective, as well as from a you know a perspective of improving run operations, is uh, you know, lots of use cases being defined to start with by UCTG and ORAN, as well as TIP and other organizations. So we want, you know, the 10, 15 use cases we have today to grow to probably 30, 40, 50, right, over the next few years. Uh, we think there are, there is enough, there are enough problems out there, a lot of complexity in these networks, and we will uh, be able to define and have some solid requirements around, you know, these additional new use cases. Beyond that, I also would like to see companies, small companies, third parties coming in and picking up these use cases, requirements and saying, I can go build a solution. And we'd like to see uh, a very strong uh, ecosystem where different companies are building the same use case, bring in different flavors, differentiation, so that operators have a, a, a very robust supply chain of these use cases. So if company A says, I don't want to focus on this use case anymore, this company B that they can then mm -hmm. trial and you know, move on. Um, so, so that's been our perspective. You know, there's a strong ecosystem. It's, near, it's going to continue to evolve. Uh, the RIC platform itself, um, I'm kind of saying, hey, it's, let's embrace the RIC concept. You know, maybe E2 is not there, but can the vendors of today provide an interface that is E2-like? Yeah. We've had a lot of success with VRE, where their simulators have, you know, emulated, simulated E2, simulated, emulated O1. Emulated ran traffic, you know, different types of networks, different type of configurations. Uh, and we're bringing in the digital twin so that mm -hmm. when we go to a lab and say, this is the VRV simulator, we're not just going to call it a VRV simulator. We're going to call it a representation of AT&T's New Jersey network. Right. What do you have in your lab is a representation of this operator's, this cluster. You know, that's the definition we want to get down to so that we can test these apps and say, mm -hmm. hey, it's proven for these particular clusters. That would be huge, actually. Yeah. And that's when we think we're getting close to it. We've we've developed the models, you know, to to get there. So I think the RIC concept needs to survive, evolve beyond the RIC. And we're also seeing a lot of interest beyond operators and vendors building solutions. We're seeing governments getting involved in promoting the RIC as well. Uh, we just had about close to 120 million dollars spent by the UK. Oh, sorry, 120 million pounds oh, <laughs> spent by the UK government. Uh, you know, they, they have what 280 million pounds allocated for RAN, open RAN, of which 100 plus pounds, 100 million plus pounds have been spent just on RIC related, uh, you know, contrib uh, you know, um, uh, projects. Uh, NTIA in the US is going to follow. Uh, we've already seen some announcements from NTIA where they're starting to, you know, fund creation of labs. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the next step would be potentially bringing in CADUs, RUs into the lab and then. The third in, inevitable step is going to be bringing Rick into the lab, and we're all looking forward to it. There is another event coming up in March, which is called the Rick Forum, oh, yeah. which NTIA is driving along with DOD. Uh, they want to see a lot of Ricks in there and see what the state of the art is in terms of the industry getting ready to you know, bring in more solutions to the market. So I'll leave you with two things. Ecosystem is really strong. Lots of players wanting to build XFR apps. Uh, you know, like they say, you know, just add water, you know, so we just need the E2 interface or E2 like interfaces <laughs> and we're good to go, you know, we're just okay. here. All right, that's a strong statement. So I'll make, can I go to you on, yeah. on evolution of the rig? So I, I'll, I'll continue on what I was saying. Definitely, um, um, by the way, warning, I'm going to hit each one of you after right. I started thinking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. So definitely, you know, we're seeing the evolution of, you know, enabling more applications. I think, you know, there was a discussion what comes first, E2 or the application. I'll argue that if there is the right application, it will push forward. 
you know, the operators and, and the other things. We need this in the, in, in the A2. You know, one of the things, maybe a little bit taking it further, is that, you know, um, how you build a, a, an application during the development and get all of these different scenarios of, you know, the different interfaces, the different data. And I think this is an area where working with you know, the cloud provider like AWS and building what we call, we, we call it, you know, lab as a service for the RIC, where you don't have to buy, you know, or build a, a huge lab. You can actually work uh, with, a, with an AWS instance, download these kind of models and start doing it during the development time. Don't wait until you actually test. So this is another evolution that we are working with the ecosystem to bring in. The idea of the dish that win, I think this is this is going to be key because it provides the maturity, but also it provides the platform for app developers, you know, like IRA building new innovations coming with a lot of different uh, ideas and tested it on a scale of a network that is real as, as real as the real network. Got it. Matty, I'm going to bring you in to provide an operator perspective on how do you guys see the rig evolving? Uh, well, for the non-real-time rig that comes with the SMO, I think that is like we previously kind of concluded 2024 sounds reasonable. It's I view that as more evolutionary rather than revolutionary. It's kind of, yeah. we already have all kinds of SON, CSON applications and the near real-time RIC, I'm sorry, non-real-time RIC platform is and more provides a standards compliant, hopefully faster platform. So in, in that evolution, I think the O1 maturing, initially, uh, at least all the brand vendors are not going to be providing O1, so the control needs to go through the EMS. But when we get to the direct O1, then, then you can do use cases faster. So maybe you can start getting close to the envisioned one second control loops or at least tens of seconds rather than than minute. Uh, for the near real time, Rick, similarly, it really depends on the E2, what is available. Because yeah, uh, you can do an app and simulate it, but uh, it, nobody will buy it until you can support it on the E2. And I would expect that the E2 will kind of, the vendors will expand it incrementally. So, so that's why I've been trying to get our vendors to give us a roadmap of what are you going to provide when so that we can start planning, but, but that hasn't really happened. But uh, I would expect like in Oran, uh, there are already half a dozen or four or five E2 service models that enable certain use cases, but there's lots of things that are not even submitted to Oran yet. So there's the pipeline of getting the service models approved, and then there's the pipeline of the vendors implementing, and then, then you can have the X apps that Got come it. with those. Got it. Masood, Ben Lance, and then Arda. Right. So um, if you could keep it to a minute. Um, sure. <laughs> so um, the, the key part is that um, uh, we have to solve, we have to bucketize the problem. What we can solve with the existing infrastructure, where the things are stable, things looking promising, and which is non-real time. For example, energy saving. We are doing a trial uh, in Europe, and they are promising even the box vendor who is who has implemented the energy saving, we can still squeeze out eight to ten percent on top of. It. So uh, and then provisioning um, management, subscriber management. So those are the applications that we can look at it. They can still simplify the network in a significant way. And then maybe as we mature and all, and then let the you know the standards as well as OEMs give a time to open up E2. Right. So just going to E2 and just trying to get it stuck that it 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 won't delay the benefit that we we can get it through non real time. Got it, Lars. Um, I think from the evolution of the RAN intelligent controllers, I think I see that path of how we can get there into production. Um. I think from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, there will the apps are critical. There are applications out there where AIML is built into the app already. The next step for us is to build AIML services into the platform and open up the ecosystem even broader to app vendors that don't have to embed the AIML in their applications. They can use the services from the platform, and that'll broaden the ecosystem even more. And that's why I can see this driving towards, you know, as we first we get the RIC out there, we get these initial apps. But then, then expanding the services provided in that platform to expand it even more. Thank you, Arda. Yes, um, 
for me, I think Rick is almost a given now. We've been hearing this. Uh, it needs to mature. It needs to be deployed. Maybe not not next year. You said uh, mm -hmm. this could be an a ongoing uh, panel and event. Maybe not next year, but the year after, rather than seeing VMware or Juniper, I want to say, think about your Android phone. Uh, you get hardware from anybody. Android abstracts everything. You have Play Store. Mm -hmm. You only think about your applications. Mm -hmm. So in the next forum or the one after that, uh, rather than having Rick vendors here, I'll be much happier to see yep. app, app vendors talking about their AML killer applications and you see Rick as part of the network. Fantastic. On that optimistic note, I want to thank this panel. Mike, you guys have done a phenomenal job.